Thank you for joining the online ministry of New Life Fellowship. May you be blessed by the Word of God. From Psalms, one of my favorite books. Psalm 51. From one of my favorite characters. Verse number 10, create in me. If it's okay, I just want to preach to myself today and everybody's welcome to listen in. Is that okay? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. A few chapters later in Psalm 139, I try to make this a prayer daily. Verse number 23, search me, O God, know my heart. We think we know our hearts, but our hearts are deceitfully wicked. But God knows us. Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me. Know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If you don't mind, just put your Bibles down. Let's ask God to speak to us today. Lord, I want to hear from you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your presence that's here. I ask, oh God, that you minister to everyone in the room today. Only like you can do, God. You know us and you see us. And I pray today that you minister in a supernatural way. Get us beyond the sermon today. And let us, oh God, hear your touch. In Jesus' name, amen. You're welcome to be seated. There's something about... These two writings that have moved me for many years. And every time I read it, it's not just like some of the other writings, but I can almost feel the emotion in which David writes. David writes these two particular passages with such emotion and with such feeling. It's something beyond just a song. It's something Beyond just a melody, he was a psalmist, he was a singer, he was a songwriter. But it's, it's beyond just a song, there's a personality to these particular writings. Create in me, O oh God, a clean heart and renew within me, not upon me, but renew within me a right spirit. Don't cast me out of your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And obviously we know that this particular dispensation, the Holy Spirit was not poured out, but yet David writes, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He said, restore my joy. Wouldn't that be a miraculous thing in some of our lives and events today? Restore my joy. Deliver me from my blood guiltness, or what he's saying is deliver me from spilling innocent blood. I want to preach to you today this thought, the responsibility of a right spirit. As he writes this, and you can do the chronological study of when he wrote this, and this particular passage in Psalm 51, he wrote following his uh, fall with grace and his fall from morality into adultery with Bathsheba, which led to murder. And so that was ever present in him when he wrote this particular psalm. And he wrote it with emotion of the past event. And he wrote it as though it had just transpired because of the emotion, but 
I believe there's something more to this writing, and if you'll give me just a moment or two to kind of lay that out, I, I would like to do that. David was a man that had strong relationship tendencies, and he had strong relationship with Jonathan. It was his dearest friend in the world, and he had strong relationship with King Saul. And it goes back to 2 Samuel chapter number 1, and you don't have to turn there. I'll just kind of skim through it. And this is a story where David is informed of the death and of the falling of not only his best friend, but also his man of God. And so a young messenger comes to David, and David said, where have you come from? And he said, I've come from the Israelite camp. And David begins to question him and asked him what he has brought as far as a message. He said, many of the Israelites had fallen and also Saul and his son David, or his, Saul, his son Jonathan have died. And as you can imagine, the shock of hearing such news of his best friend and his king and his man of God, they're dead. And so David begins to inquire as anyone with strong emotional tendencies would do. And he begins to ask him the details and he begins to ask him all the things that had happened. And the young man begins to tell David what Saul had instructed him to do and how Saul had told him to end his life because he wasn't going to live much longer. And when he explained this to David, there is an emotional thing that came over David like we have not seen before. It gripped him and it tore at him. And David became so emotionally moved at the news and at the moment that he ordered the messenger to be killed. And then he writes a real infamous writing there at the end of that chapter. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Let the daughters of the Philistines, lest the daughter of the Philistines be glad. Lest the mount or the daughters rejoice. And he goes on to write about the fall and the death of his dearest and best friend and of his king. And he ends by saying, how the mighty have fallen. There's an emotion there and there is a life-changing moment there that took place. And it's in this that I tie Psalm 51 where he writes, Cleanse me, O God, and renew a right spirit. I believe earnestly and honestly that David wrote Psalm 51 with the story and with the feeling of Saul and Jonathan in mind. How the mighty have fallen. Let me just kind of bring a little focus to the relationship. David lived in Saul's palace for probably, historically, they guess about seven years or so. He, he was just a young man. He was just a boy, maybe 15 years old. And what an impression in the mind of a 15-year-old boy to move into the palace of the king, if you can think about that. David's very best friend on the planet was Jonathan, the son of the king. On top of all of that, David's first love. Does anybody remember your first love? David's first love was Saul's daughter and he marries her at a young age. And so there's a closeness. There's a kinship. We always really just kind of think about two men of God kind of battling out. But no, there was a personal relationship there between Saul and David. There was a kinship there. There was family there. There was respect there. 
Is anybody in the room, and I don't want you to show a hand or, or physically respond, but has anyone in the room ever witnessed the fall of a giant in your life? How the mighty have fallen. I was born and raised in the home of J.R. and Betty Blackshear in, in Alaska. My mom and dad are the greatest Christians I know. And back in those days, there was no hotels and there was no, you know, you don't have evangelist quarters. Brother Rodenbush, you would remember in those days when a guest minister would come through Anchorage, they not only stayed in our house, but they would stay in my room. And I remember playing ball in the backyard with spiritual giants that I had no clue really who they were other than some guest preacher that was coming through. And so I grew up kind of like that, and I formed spiritual heroes and spiritual giants. And every once in a while, you would hear the news of the fall of a mighty man of God. And and it would grip me and it would wound me. And some of those I still weep over. How the mighty have fallen. Some reason or another, some of those no longer stand in our pulpits and some of them no longer preach this apostolic message that we love and we adhere to with everything inside of us. Mighty men that have fallen in the battle of life. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. My wife is from the California and we get there quite often. One of my children, uh, two of my sons have went to college there and, and I, I do some work there and I get there quite often and, and I was there not too long ago and I read the story of what happened in January 7th in 2017. It was a mighty sequoia tree that fell in a California state park and uh, it was an iconic tree. It had stood for over 1,000 years. It was named the Pioneer Cabin Tree. Thousands of visitors had visited that tree and tens of thousands of pictures had been taken by people in front of that mighty sequoia tree. Pictures that had dated back to 1899. Think of that, 1899 show the tree being used as not just a backdrop, but it showed the tree being used as a thing of safety and shelter. So many travelers and pioneers over the years that were traveling west would find themselves going through that area, and in the wintertime, a, a storm would come through, and they would find themselves in that area being sheltered by that strong, mighty tree. But on January 7th, 2017, it fell. And like they do in California, they research and study everything. And so when the scientists came to their conclusion, they said when the tree fell, it was barely alive. It still looked strong. It still looked tall. It still looked mighty. But it was a simple rainstorm that had brought down the pioneer cabin tree. Well over 120 years previous to its fall, when somebody traveling west had carved a tunnel into that giant tree, and there was a process of decay that had started during that process that it never regained its health from. The tree was barely alive, but it was a simple rainstorm that brought it down. How the mighty have fallen. What is it that causes the mighty to fall? What is it that we read here in these passages about the emotions of David? What, what is it that begins a process 
soul of decay that eventually brings down the biggest and the best among us. David had a front row seat. I appreciate you, young men. I highly respect you, young men, for having a front row seat this morning. And I applaud you. And I'll just prophesy that the hand of God is going to be upon you. Saul, on his platform, gave David a front row seat to his life's happenings. And I believe that David, as a front row witness to the fall of Saul, understood what it was that created the process of decay inside his father-in-law, his man of God, his king, Saul. And because of what he witnessed and because of what David had also uh, found himself in, he writes under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, created me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew within me a right spirit. That word, Create. I don't want to uh, uh, go into Hebrew and to Greek this morning because I don't know any of it. But this one word, create, the Hebrew word for that is bara, B A R A. And you find it in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's the same word, it simply means a divine action. It means I can't do it. Pastor Harpole can't do it. No one, it has to be a divine action from God. And when, when David says, create in me a clean heart, oh God, it is something that only God can do. The cleansing of a heart I was so moved this morning when you gave out baptismal certificates. Thank you, church, for doing that. What a beautiful thing. That's not ceremony. Matter of fact, when you did that, if you listened real closely, all of heaven began to rejoice. All of heaven began to celebrate. All of heaven began to... What a beautiful thing when somebody repents and is baptized in Jesus' name. Redemption is a divine work that only God can do. Isaiah 1 and 18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Psalm 103 and 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed, oh hallelujah, our transgressions from us. Colossians 1 and 14, in whom we have redemption. How? Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins created in me, oh God, a clean heart. It's something the church can help with, but it's something that only God can do. However, the rest of this verse is really what I want to preach about today, and I'm sorry for the long introduction. The rest of this verse is really the foundation of what I'm speaking about today. Renew a right spirit within me. That word renew also means this in the original, to repair, to rebuild, or to renew one's self. It's the original text, to repair, to rebuild, or to renew one's self. To renew is a self-dependent action that only we can do for ourselves. I have learned that God cannot nor God will not do for us what we are responsible to do for ourselves. I want to preach to you today the responsibility of my spirit being right. The responsibility of my spirit being right. It's up to me and it's up to myself to get my spirit right. 
God's responsible to redeem me. And when I go down in that watery grave of baptism, I come up a brand new creature. But somewhere along the roads of life and of church world and of church hurt, oh, what a word. My spirit being right. It's not a responsibility of the Holy Ghost. Somebody please hear me this morning. My spirit being right. My spirit being rebuilt. My spirit being renewed. It's my responsibility. It's my responsibility. I have learned that if keeping my spirit right would just be a matter of prayer. Oh, how I love your prayer room. It's one of the most beautiful prayer rooms I've ever seen. But it's not a shrine. It's actually a place that we go and we pour ourselves out to the Lord. But if my spirit being renewed was just a matter of prayer, then when I walked out, of the prayer room, you would think that all my bitterness would be gone, all my strife would be gone, all my pride, all my ego, all my stuff would be gone, but I'm responsible. I'm responsible. I've preached to this church today the responsibility of a right spirit. It's yours, and it's yours alone. Thank God for a pastor. Thank God for a pastor's wife. Thank God for a pastoral board. I'm 57 years old. I was raised in the home of a district superintendent. I happen to serve in some of those capacities now, and I serve on several different boards, but I have come to the conclusion that I must have the place where I renew myself every day. I've got to renew my spirit. Position does not cleanse my spirit. Position does not purify my heart. I have elders in my life. My pastor called me this morning. It touched my heart. It touched me. He told me to tell you, brother and sister Harpo, how much he loves you. And then he texted me. He said, please tell them how much I love them. I can go to him for direction. I can go to him and get some things worked out. But I have got to renew my spirit. I've got to renew my spirit. It's my responsibility. I can get help with my doctrine. I can get help with my foundation. I can go to elders and I can go to districts and I, I can do all, I can get a lot of these things worked out. Young man, you can get your you can get your giftings all patterned out and all mapped out. See your see your leadership and, and all of that. But but when I need my spirit adjusted. Here's what I've learned in the last 32 years of pastoring, and I don't know how many years of preaching. I can have my doctrine right. my spirit wrong. I can have my giftings right and my spirit wrong. I can have my separation and my preaching right and my spirit wrong. The responsibility of a right spirit is mine and mine alone. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. David saw it firsthand, and he created boundaries in his life that that would not happen to him. He watched his king. He watched his father-in-law. He watched his mentor get bitter and lose his pure spirit. Why does David write with such passion? David understands that if he doesn't renew his spirit that like the mighty sequoia tree, there could be a day and there could be a time that the infection on the outside makes root to the inside. It's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. How's it possible? How, how does it occur? How does such a mighty man or woman of God who's been used to impact so many people how does it happen? How do, how do they fall? How do they, how do they lose out? I'll tell you how. The spirit was never repaired. The spirit was never rebuilt. It was never renewed. The heart could have been cleansed, but 
The spirit was never renewed. A contaminated spirit is a self-inflicted wound that only an altar of self can alter. A contaminated spirit is a self-inflicted wound that only an altar can alter. There is a difference, my sweet brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, guests, friends. There is a difference in forgiveness and wholeness. God forgives, we can forgive, but I'm preaching about wholeness. Let me just contrast the difference between David and Saul real quickly. Both men were chosen by God. Actually, the people asked God for a king, and God accommodated their request, and he chose Saul to be their king because they wanted a king. But regardless, God chose both of the men. Both of the men, David and Saul, were anointed by God, and both of the men were placed in the role of authority by God. But here's what God says about the difference between the two. Acts 13 and 22. I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. But here's what he says about his other choice, 1 Samuel 15 and 11. It repenteth me. God speaks about repenteth me that I have chosen and set up Saul to be the king because he's turned his back from following me. Both men were chosen, but one ended up in covenant and one ended up causing God regret. What's the difference? Here's the difference. One understood the value of renewing his right spirit. It's not a matter of being free from failure. David was a man that was plagued with a lot of failure. In our eyes, murder and adultery are ministry-ending episodes. It's not a matter of God's forgiveness. It was a matter of keeping his spirit right. Hey, Saul... Don't justify your bitterness because his sin was greater than yours. Saul, don't justify your bitterness and your disease of the inner heart because his sin was greater than yours. Both of these men were confronted by the men of God about their failures. Boy, this is a test of a right spirit. Both men were confronted by the man of God about the failures in their life. Aren't you glad you have a man of God in your life? Aren't you glad you have a woman of God in your life? Now, I don't, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, and I don't want to cause any delusional thinking, but not every pastor is spirit-led. It's one thing to get up and preach about prayer and fasting. It's another thing to actually pray and fast. Do you have a spiritual shepherd? you have a spiritual man and woman of God that watches over your soul? And not only do they watch over your soul, they will have to stand and give an account, and we take that with all gravity. You have a spiritual man of God in your life. What's my response when the man of God in my life confronts me about my failure. Both David and Saul had this happen. Saul gets angry, and Saul tears at the cloak of Samuel. However, David falls on his face, and he repents before God. My sweet brothers and sisters, your reaction to the Spirit-led man of God who confronts you in your way of iniquity and your way of sin is a good indication of the spiritual condition of your spirit. 
Saul was angry because Samuel refused to join him in a public act of worship, which would tell the people that all was well between Saul and Samuel. And his image was more important than his integrity. When the finger of God is in my face, what's my reaction? Only those that are submitted to God will endure the inspection of God. Young man of God, young preacher, I want to just tell you something. Only those that are submitted to God will endure the inspection of God. I cannot have a right spirit without giving my spiritual authority access into my life. I cannot have a right spirit without giving my spiritual authority access into my life. Let me tell you what's going on in these last days. The spirit of Herodias is alive and well. The spirit of Jezebel is alive and well. And let me tell you what that spirit is. I know there's a million books on it, but let me tell you biblically what that spirit is. That spirit is the spirit that wants to cut off the head of the prophetic. When the prophet sticks a finger in the face and says you're living in sin, the spirit of Herodias says chop the head of the prophetic off so my sin can remain hidden. It's still alive and well in this world today. But let me tell you, I need the finger of a Nathan to point in my face. I need the finger of a prophet to point in my face. How's my spirit when my prophet comes and points out my iniquity? Can I just tell you this? God cannot trust what he cannot inspect. And God will not use what he cannot trust. I want to be used by God. I want to be used by God. Search me, God. That's what David's writing about. Search me, God. Know my heart. Know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way. Try me. Try me. Hey, young preacher, I don't really care at this particular moment about your giftings. I'm proud of our young preachers. I've never seen giftings. I've never seen talent. I've never seen a generation like this generation that's coming out of the saddle blazing on fire for God. I've never seen it like this before. I'm so happy and I'm so proud. But I don't care about your gifting. How's your spirit? Hey, young man, young woman of God, I, I don't really care right now about your talents and I know this generation is full of them. Talk to me about your spirit. Child of God, can we not be so intoxicated on being delivered and forgiven that we lose sight of renewing our spirits before the Lord? The responsibility of a right spirit. My anointing does not validate my wrong spirit. Don't confuse calling and consecration. They're worlds apart. Don't confuse calling and the cross. The difference between an anointed man of God and a gifted man of God is one's willing to be purged. And one is not. One's willing to be rebuked. One's willing to be corrected chastised and crucified if I cannot be purged I cannot be used in the kingdom of God take up your cross and follow me take up your cross and follow me let me tell you what's changed my life and and I'm not trying to be humorous I'm just trying to give you a good analogy I I lose everything my wife will be uh, a, a testifier of the fact I, I have become an investor of the Apple, uh, what are those things called? 
air tags. I left the little apartment this morning and I had five alerts on my phone. Uh, your carry-on was left behind. Your backpack was left behind. Your I lose everything. I cannot ever get to the place where I say, have you seen my cross? I want to ask you, where, when's the last time you saw your cross? When, when's the last time you saw an altar? When's the last time you had a, a cross experience? Search me, God. There's stuff in me that's not like you. Cleanse my spirit, but oh God, I've got to renew my spirit. I've got to stay near the cross. I'm trying to close. It's not coincidence that God told David. I love studying the life of David. There's so many neat things, but God told David, a man after his own heart, you would think that God would say, I love you, David. You're a man after my own. Why don't you build my house? But he didn't say that to David. He said, you cannot build my house, but your son Solomon is going to build my house. And David scratched his head. David did not understand. Solomon, you mean the offspring of David and Bathsheba? Yeah. Him. Solomon is the offspring of David and Bathsheba. And so when David, or when Solomon begins to plan out the temple, and he begins to build the temple, the layout was, was eerily sim similar to, to the tabernacle in the wilderness. It, it was really close to the same layout, and, and the ark, they decided to use the same ark, and and, and, and a lot of the things were the same, but when Solomon begins to build the altar, the altar that Solomon, the offspring of David and Bathsheba, him, the altar that Solomon built was 54 times larger than the altar and the tabernacle. I think if anybody understood the need for a big altar, it was the offspring of David and Bathsheba. Your altar has got to be bigger than your ark. I love signs and miracles and wonders, and I love the stuff in the ark. But let me tell you something. I can't get to the ark until I go to the altar. I can get to the altar without going to the holy place. I can get to the altar without getting to the laver. But I cannot get to the holy place without ever bypassing the altar. If I get this wrong, if I get this wrong, if I get this wrong, you, you ask how the mighty have fallen, let me just kind of share my personal opinion. If we get this wrong and we approach the holy place with too much of us, don't last very long. Psalm 51 and 11, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Could it be that the retention of David's anointing was completely contingent upon the fact of him renewing a right spirit? I'm responsible for my spirit being right. I'm responsible for my spirit being right. Psalm 51, it was written in B.C. 1034. B.C. 1034. But Psalm 139, the one that says, search me, it was written 14 years later. It's an ongoing process. This is not once and done. But I've got to wake up tomorrow morning. I'm going to wake up in a hotel room in Seattle tomorrow. And when I wake up tomorrow, I've got to say, God, search me. Musicians, come back. Let's stand. Search me. Search me. Know my heart. Know my heart. You know what? Jesus told us offenses were going to come. He told us offenses were going to come. And yet we get offended when they come. 
I've got a man in our church, and I was preaching along these lines one time, and I think it was maybe a midweek series, and he came to me after church one time, and he said, Pastor, I just want to tell you something. You can't offend me. Tell me what my family needs to do to be saved. Tell me, Pastor, what I got to do. You can't offend me. You can't offend me, Pastor. What a generation of offense we're going to, we're going to, we're living in. Jesus said it's going to come. Search me, Lord. What are you going to do about it? David, what are you going to do when your hero picks up a javelin? Your mentor, your hero. And he throws a javelin at you, David. Let me tell you what David's going to do. Search me. I know from prayer this morning that there's people under the sound of my voice that have been hurt. You have been wounded. I don't know any details, and I don't want to know any details. All I know is there are people under the sound of my voice that you have been hurt legitimately. The choice is on you to renew your spirit. You have legitimate cause to be bitter. I argue not that point. But what are you going to do with it? And if I came for Nam, then so be it. But could it be that I came this morning because somebody in this building is so valuable in the kingdom of God? Renew a right spirit. Don't let that seed lie dormant. Don't let that seed lie dormant. Don't hold others responsible. Don't hold God responsible for only what I can do. David, you got to get this right. David, if you don't get this right, the prophecies of Isaiah are null and void. The Messiah is going to come from your loins. David, you got to get this right. I'm here to prophetically tell somebody that the future generations of the apostolic heritage is dependent on you getting this right. Search me. Come on, I'm done. Let's pray. Search me. Let my spirit be right. Renew in me. Renew in me. Renew in me. Renew a right spirit. Oh, let there be a cry to the Lord right now. Come on up in the balconies. In this altar area. Come on, moms and dads. Get this right. Come on, grandparents. Get this right. Come on, apostolic people of God, guests, get this right today. Get this right today. Thank you for watching today. If you would like to help us continue to deliver content around the world online, please consider making a donation. Head to newlifeterrahoe.com and choose the giving option that works best for you. Have a great day.